Hi again then guys and welcome to yet another installment of the Beards and Cars podcast and as always this audio only version will be dropping later on today on SoundCloud so slap the link down below to go and check that out as well as the previous few weeks as well but as far as this topic goes as you saw from the title and from the thumbnail it's a topic which a lot of people probably wouldn't really have many great thoughts about at this point because the vast majority of the discussion regarding GT sport tends to be a negative one. There are plenty of people who do enjoy it, but of those people who do still genuinely love the game, they tend to all still love it for the same reason, the online racing. Most people who don't absolutely love the online racing tend to kind of drop off after a while. As I've said before, I have numbers of messages from people which are definitely coming in at a higher frequency than they used to from people who say that they don't even play the game anymore apart from those few days each month where a new update drops. And even then, sometimes people don't come back and they just do two updates at once the month after. So for the purpose of this video, I wanted to, for myself at least, and you could certainly do this down in the comments yourself, and I would urge you to, I'd love to read those as well as always, but five things in particular that I think GT Sport actually does well, and things which I would say they do well enough to actually want to see them come back in a, you know, Gran Turismo 7. We'll call it GT7 because we don't absolutely know that it's going to be, but let's just assume that the next game is GT7 rather than GT Sport 2. So either way, you could consider it even if it is GT Sport 2. This is just five things that I would personally love to see brought back again, or at least done to the same standard that they currently are. The first one on my list is the graphics, but more specifically the effort that Polyphony puts into said graphics. Now, although they've said in the past that it takes around six months to render a single car into the game, which many people doubt or think is, you know, really overdoing it or whatever, and of course you can have an entire episode on that discussion alone, but regardless of all that stuff, The fact remains that the cars do look very good. Regardless of how long they take or how many we have, they do look very good for the most part. There are some exceptions. The exhausts, for instance, on the Toyota FT1 concept. A few little things like that. The Porsche 911 headlights. But generally speaking, they look very good. Scapes, for instance, look so realistic sometimes that you would think it was a real photo. And at the end of the day, Gran Turismo's legacy, I would argue more than anything else, especially back in the day, was that it looked groundbreaking compared to pretty much every other game on the market. Gran Turismo 2, I remember, looked incredible for the time. It had virtually unparalleled reflections and mirroring on the car's bodies that no other racing game was even trying to do. Gran Turismo 4 looked absolutely incredible for the time. Streets Ahead of Enthusia or Forza at that time, which looked a little bit more pasty and cartoonish in comparison. And although, of course, the rivalries and the competitors have gotten better for sure over time and now you've got newcomers like AC and Project Cars offering a really good level of visual quality as well. Gran Turismo does still set itself apart by having just the most exquisite level of visual detail and attention to detail. I mean Gran Turismo for instance is one of those games where you never need to worry about the shape or the scale of a car. It's not like Forza 3, for instance, where the Honda NSX looks completely wrong, or Forza 4, where the Zonda C12 looks wrong, or Test Drive Unlimited, where the Ascari KZ1 looks completely wrong. Gran Turismo has always taken great care to make the cars look as accurate to real life as they can, even to the point of like damage and dirt and details, which is fantastic. It's awesome to see. So that is for sure something that I would love to see carried over. And I think that of the five things on this list, that's probably one of the things which you can really bet some money on that they will carry that over because even though in the past they do have a track record of you know using the ps2 era graphics up until gt6 and stuff like that which was controversial at this point if they carried over these graphics to the ps5 i don't think many of us would complain because the cars do already look so good. And of course you can always improve it even more. There are little details that you can notice, maybe shapes that aren't quite as rounded as they should be, but generally speaking, you know what I mean. Next up for me, I would say, is the next thing actually that you generally notice when you play a new racing game right after the graphics, and that is the physics. Usually when you play a brand new game, you look at how the cars look first, and then you drive one of them to see how it feels. So it's a very important thing. For me personally, it's definitely second on my list, and that's why it's second on this list, because I actually like the physics of GT Sport, the physics engine, if you will, because 
My favourite physics of any Gran Turismo game are still probably Gran Turismo 5. It's smoother than GT6, but more realistic than anything previous to that. At the same time, though, I do like the realism combined with still being fun on a controller, for instance, that Gran Turismo Sport has, because there are games that I would love to play here on the channel, but they just don't have the kind of controller feedback and support really that they need for me to enjoy them and for many other people to as well like project cars and ac so the fact that gran turismo still puts all of that effort into that is very impressive to me and i'm glad that they do as far as the physics of the cars themselves well as i said i do like it i like the fact that you can really feel the weight of the vehicles you've got tire deformity you've got suspension which is unparalleled in any previous gran turismo game in terms of the body roll and how the suspension really works through corners it feels fantastic the top speeds are a lot more realistic than they have arguably ever been in gran turismo which is you know to the chagrin of me originally because i used to love making those crazy fast speed tunes but if you lower all of the cars then at least it's still competitive so you can still make speed tunes it's just not as common for cars to hit 300 miles an hour anymore so even though i was initially disappointed by that aspect there are still some cars that can run close to 300 but it tends to be very very few and far between in comparison to the previous game where an alfa romeo could do it a viper could do it you could get a mercedes c63 sedan to be quicker than a tvr speed 12 all kinds of ridiculous stuff so the physics, I think, would be a pretty cool thing if they did carry that over as well. The next thing is the quality of scapes. And I'm not necessarily talking about any specific scapes location, because there are so many and I love so many of them, but I mean the attention to detail that they have, because scapes and photo mode in general has been an important part of Gran Turismo since Gran Turismo 4. And I immediately fell in love with the idea of using the game to take photos of cars back then. I used to take loads of them. You couldn't really save many photos onto the memory card at that point. You had to use like a, a USB stick to do it. But ever since then, the photo mode became much more of a thing. You can tell that Kaz and the team behind the game love that aspect of it. It's a very artistic point of the game. And we'll come back to artistic stuff later on in this video. But for me, I love the level of effort and detail and also creativity that they put into the scapes mode. I do think it's actually one of the single best aspects of this game. And it's one of the aspects of the game that you don't really hear people complaining about because it's done so well. If only the rest of the game was done to the same standard as that. Next up for me is one which might be more controversial out of the five. For me personally, it's definitely the one which I have some addendums with or some caveats, and that is the self-serious online racing. And I'm not talking about regular lobbies, I'm talking about sport mode, I'm talking about Nations Cup, I'm talking about Manufacturers Cup, and even including the live events. Because even though some of those are never something that I would be interested in, even if I were at that level, I do appreciate that many people are. Many people do love the idea of becoming a real race driver. I personally think that the Nismo Academy was a better way of doing that. This way it just has more of a, I don't know, like F1 style vibe to it with the FIA integration and now the official Michelin partnership for tyres and all that kind of stuff. They are clearly trying to give everyone a reason to take it seriously, which is fair enough. But I personally believe that if you're just looking to make race drivers, the Nismo Cup seemed like a more efficient way of doing that. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But when I look back over all the drivers that came from that, they seem to have done better for themselves than the current crop are. And although, of course, they've got time passing on their side, which makes a huge difference, it just seems like, I don't know, even a, a more professional approach in a weird kind of way. Having that Nismo Academy, Nissan, of course, al already was and always was a partner of Gran Turismo. But I don't know, maybe that's just me. But the Nismo Academy to me just seems like a, a more efficient creator driver program than the sport mode stuff does. But Maybe it's just not intended for the same thing. And to some degree, it's not, of course. It's not just a um, create the next Schumacher simulator. It's more of a world-spanning official racing series. And of course, that's what they're going for. But at the same time, I do like aspects of how self-serious the sport mode is. And what I mean by that is that in sport mode in particular, although you do have some stupid drivers, they do definitely seem to make an effort to give those races weight and value because many of you guys know especially if you've been around on the channel for quite a while that i've only been racing in sport mode for like what a couple of months now if that 
and I just had no interest in it before. But when I actually did that first race, and especially carried on with the subsequent ones, with the occasional bad driver or wrong penalty, and of course that again is its entire own discussion, I do like that they try to make it feel like it means something. Those races feel like they have significance to you and your game experience far more so than a lobby does. And of course, they're they're totally different. Both of them are races, but they're entirely different purposes. Sport mode is about the competitive fun, improving yourself as a driver, challenging yourself, racing with other people who are going to be at your level. The lobbies, on the other hand, they're just not. They're designed purely for fun, and I'm all for that. I still spend more time overall in lobbies than I do in sport mode, but I love the aspect of sport mode where it does take it seriously. And I do hope, and I do believe, actually, that they'll carry a lot of that over. Especially, of course, now, as if there were any doubt, now that they have partnered with Michelin, that's not the kind of thing that you do just for one game. So they are clearly fully intending to carry over the sport mode, maybe not called sport mode, but it probably still will be, into the next game, be that a GT Sport 2 or a Gran Turismo 7 title. Obviously the FIA stuff, the Nations Cup stuff, the Michelin integration, it will be carried over. I can guarantee that. It will be in the next game. The only caveat to all of this is that I hope they remember that not all of us care. (laughs) <laughs> and at the end of the day, a game needs to appeal to the fan base that it's already got, not just create new fans. So creating these new fans who just want to race online all the time and become a real racing driver, that's all well and good. But let's remember this is a game, not just a pure simulator for people who want to grow up to be a racing driver. There are some who do, but most of us don't. Most of us couldn't care less about being a real racing driver, we just want to have fun on a game. So. As long as they don't lose sight of that, which I think has been one of the main issues with this game, because they clearly have, career mode was an afterthought, as we've said before, the scope and even the importance of career mode just isn't there compared to previous games. Even Gran Turismo 6, where you could complete the career mode very quickly, it still felt like it meant more. At least you had, you know, unlockable stuff in career mode, it felt like it had some weight to it, whereas now... It's just a bunch of races with some throwback names slapped on them. So at the end of the day, career mode is more about just earning some quick cash than actually enjoying the racing. And I think that's a shame because if you compare that to like Gran Turismo 4 and 5, career mode was incredible in those games. In Gran Turismo 4, it was the the first proper endurance races, which were incredible. In Gran Turismo 5, you had the most expansive B-spec mode we've ever had, and being a race manager was so fun, spanning the same career mode that you had in single-player mode, then mirrored in director's mode. I think that was a genius move. But GT Sport just doesn't have that. So for me, I do like how seriously they take sport mode, but I think there is a very fine line, which Polyphony is way over at this point, of just pandering to that. And of course, I've spoken about that at length, Doubtless we'll talk about it again. It's the whole top 1% mentality. It's all well and good for those guys, but many of us don't care. So if you just focus on the top 1% of players all the time, you are going to alienate the rest of the audience. You will make them jealous, you will make them bored, and you will make them think, well, if you're not going to cater for us, why should we buy your next game? Why not just go to Forza, Project Cars, AC, whatever else comes out this week instead? And that, regardless of the purity of the sport, is just a bad business move. It's as simple as that. doesn't matter what kind of audience you're trying to appeal to. If you already have a track record that's wider than that audience, you are going to lose them. So for me, it's kind of a love and hate thing. I definitely love that one aspect, but it's a very, very fine line. And one which I think they really need to get their priorities straight on, or at least make it much more clear next time to people who clearly weren't as up on what the purpose of GT Sport was as they thought they were. So, yeah, you could easily make an entire episode on that, of course. But the final point, the fifth one, is actually tying in with the artistic aspect of the game, once again, that I referenced in the Scapes section earlier on, and that is the livery editor. And I know that this is something which people wanted for so long. It was a very slow process of getting to this point. Gran Turismo 4... You could uh, just buy the car in a colour, and that was it. 
if you wanted a different color, you had to buy an entirely new car. Gran Turismo 5 moved on slightly from that, where you could use colors, but only the colors that you'd unlocked from cars. Then Gran Turismo 6 had far more colors to choose from, far better integration, and then Gran Turismo Sport with the full scapes, or full livery editor, I should say, which really complements the scapes locations as well. The thing that I would like to see expounded on a lot more in the next game is the suit side of things. The helmet stuff is pretty good, maybe some tinted visors would be nice, but the suits themselves, just painting very small panels of the suit, it gets boring quite quickly. And would it really be that difficult to make the full suit paintable compared to what we what we currently have? I know that for me, I would love to paint a full suit instead. I have certain designs that I just can't really do without that option. So for me, that's the main part of livery editor that I would like to see expanded, specifically the suits. But as far as the cars go, it's a good system. It, it takes a little bit longer to learn the system, I think, than something like Forza, which is very beginner friendly. But once you do, it's a very rewarding one, I think. So overall, that's it for my five things that I would like to see carried over from GT Sport into GT7. And we might do another episode about things which GT Sport doesn't have or has done badly. But again, that kind of ties into one of the collab episodes that I'm going to do with Maverick, which we still got to get around to doing that. But some of those aspects tie in. And even some of the things that I referenced this time about alienating the community and only catering to the 1%, those kind of things will come up again in that episode as well because it's an ongoing issue, so it requires ongoing discussion. So ultimately, that's it for my five pick. I would love to hear yours down below, and as I said, be sure to check out the SoundCloud page if you are a fan of podcasts and would like to listen to it in that form. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.